specialist uh, with them. And I'm go there, I'm go here. First thing I want to touch on is just kind of the changes we're seeing in the Mid South. We're, we're seeing a lot of these glyphosate resistant grass species become more and more of an issue, and, and they're really an issue more so on corn than soybeans or cotton. Because in those, we're at least we can throw some select in there. Um, a lot of folks are getting there's some fairly cheap now three pound clethodim products out there. You put four ounces of that in with Roundup, and you can take care of all these things. But Italian ryegrass is one of the one of the big ones. Uh, if you don't have something done with it, you know, in our no-till environment prior to it coming up, there's nothing you can do once it's up. So you got to try and stomp on it. Then I get more calls in the spring anymore about how close to corn plant and I can spray select and not hurt the corn than I've uh, gotten in the well, ever last couple of years. This one's really getting to be, be more of an issue and it's kind of creeped up out of Mississippi on us more and more. Uh, the goosegrass, glyphosate resistant goosegrass, uh, is, is we, we identified it about, mm, when was that? About 07, 08 and it's continually getting worse and spreading mostly up and down the river counties. Um, but again, I know, you know, you get a lot of those folks, and anytime they spray select any, or Roundup anymore, they're putting some select in there to try and take it out. It's just, I don't know how long select's going to last. Then I don't know what we will do. We just documented glyphosate resistant Johnson grass this winter uh, in Tennessee. It's been in Arkansas and Mississippi for some time. It's the first time we've seen it in Tennessee. It's, we've got it in now three or four counties. Can't do a lot with it uh, once, you, once you get it rolling. Um, one of the things that is good on it, though, surprisingly, is liberty. We use more liberty all the time. So that's part of the issue. The other thing, and this is some work uh, Tom Mueller, one of my colleagues, did uh, looking at atrazine. And when, when I first got here, I got some calls from some growers, and they said, we've got atrazine-resistant weeds. And I said, well, which one? And they said, well, all of them. <laughs> so I knew something wasn't right. So I pulled some soil from those fields and sent them to him. And uh, he, then he took some soil right off the Knoxville campus that had never seen atrazine, and he put atrazine on it. And he, he plotted out how long it lasted. So the blue line here is, is right off the Knoxville campus um, and he put two pounds of atrazine on it. And this is out of the cornfield I pulled out of Henry County. Um, make a long story short, it's not lasting. Uh, to get any herbicidal activity out of atrazine, you need to be around 800 parts per billion. So we're only getting maybe three days residual control out of atrazine um, in there is what, what this study showed compared to soil that had never seen atrazine we're getting getting close to three weeks since then he's expanded this and he's gotten soil samples from all over just about i'm just trying to think of the states that weren't in it i think ohio maybe a couple others um, missouri was in it uh, iowa illinois indiana same results in every case where he pulled fields that you know had corn on it within the last previous years to fields that are that were maybe continuous soybeans this this pattern showed up every time what is happening is as the, as the soil is exposed to atrazine, it's building up the microbes in the soil that eat atrazine. And to the point now that atrazine really doesn't provide you any help at all from a residual standpoint, really all you're getting out of it is from that post-emergence burn down uh, when you're using it. So that's, that's kind of, you know, from the management side from it. From the EPA side of it, the EPA, if you look at their models, and every time, about every three years somebody's trying to kill atrazine and and their models suggest that it lasts three weeks and so it's exposed to the water that long in reality it lasts about three days in most of our soils is that in uh, rotated fields too yes yes you have to be out and they're still trying to do this but you have to be out uh, of corn for like four or five years before really? you see it start to go back wow. yeah it's it's pretty pretty constant once you once you spill it up that's exactly what I was thinking when you showed that that it would be great that the EPA knows that this is how it's really Oh happening. yeah, yeah, exactly. And this is some of the data they really need yeah. to actually make an accurate <laughs> guesstimate of how long it lasts. So, um, but anyway, this is very consistent across just everywhere. Uh, all the southern states looked at it and most of the midwestern states uh, as well. The other big calls I get every year is how to kill big palmer pigweed and big corn. Uh, it happens time and time again and typically by the time they call it's way past labeled for atrazine. Um, that 12 inch label uh, and I get calls on fields that look like that you know what, what do we do with them so we did some studies had actually a graduate student she worked on this a couple years uh, looking at applications in that v5 to v6 corn range palmer pigweed that's pretty good size um, and we did some just standalone treatments and then some standalone treatments you know like halix gt and 
capri, you know, things like that, tank mixed with, with status, which is a, a dicamba formulation. It's got a safener in it. Um, and this is some of the stuff we looked at. Uh, we looked at just straight Roundup. We looked at Liberty, Halix GT, which is the most popular herbicide used in Tennessee today. Uh, Caprino, which is probably second at this point. Uh, then Lotus, Callisto, Realm Q, just and, and, and distinct. Um, there's the rates we use for <coughs> Liberty Quarter, uh, uh, four pints of Halix, three ounces of Caprino, three of Lotus, three, four. I uh, went with eight ounces of status. Here's where we look at uh, a control seven days after application uh, with these. And kind of the take home point, uh, adding status with it in every case, increase the control on these big pigweeds. You've got to have at least two <coughs> effective modes of action on it to control it. Atrazine would be another option. And how big were these pigweeds again? So they were eight to 12 inches tall. Yeah, good size, good size. Um, but status made a difference. I like status, it's essentially distinct with that bare safener in it. It's a good safener. Uh, back pioneer days, I was always scared to death of dicamba on corn. <laughs> it can cause issues. Um, so here's some of the pictures, what Halix looks like, <coughs> just straight Halix on, on that big of corn. It did fairly well. Shot. There it is with distinct in, or with status in with it. It basically finishes off those survivors. There's Caprino. There's Caprino with, with status tank mixed in with it. They're, they're folding down. This is what you can get into with the injury. I think probably everybody has seen this if you sprayed any kind of dicamba on corn, particularly if you do it late. And there are some hybrids that are a little more sensitive than others to it. Uh, you'll find some of the time. But you'll get these brace roots, especially if you spray a little bit too big. They'll fuse together. And sometimes if you're really lucky, the brace roots will grow upside down uh, on it. And you'll see that from time to time. I rarely see it with the, with the newer, like the Status, with it's got the safener in it. I think Bayer's got a new one out called Diflex. It's got a safener in it. Um, you, don't, you don't see it so much with those. So all of Dicambus the same in corn? Well, not exactly. And they all have different labels. Uh, the Clarity Bamboo we're all familiar with, you can go a pint up to eight inches. Um, anything over eight inches, then you can only do half a pint. Status on corn, uh, V2 to V10. So you can't do it just straight out of the ground up to, up to 36 inches tall. Now status is dicamba, diflufensin pier, which is oxygen transporter, and I have soxidifin, that's the safener. Um, it's about a four to one ratio because of this oxygen transporter to what that camber would be. So four ounces of clarity, would, or four ounces of status is equivalent to about a pint of clarity as far as how it actually works in the weed. Uh, Diflex, which is brand new from Bayer, is spike B6 up to 36 inches tall. And this dicamba, it's not, doesn't have diflufensin pair in it, and it's got a new safener from Bayer uh, in it. Here's some of the other cutoffs. Atrazine, of course, is 12 inches. Halix GT is, is V8 to 30 inches, so that's why a lot of folks are using that late. Caprino, every time I, every year they keep dropping the height on it. It's V5 now, it was V7 or V8. Realm Q's V7. Glyphosate's V8 to 30 inches tall. People always ask me how much I can push that. It always concerns me pushing it. Roundup kills pollen. You start pushing it later in that, you could have some issues with pollination if the stars line up wrong. Uh, Armazon impact is up to V8. In, in summary, my whole philosophy on, on corn no is no single application on the weeds we've got is consistently going to control. Uh, Palmer pigweed will start germinating in March and it'll keep germinating clear into October and it, it, there's no herbicide that's going to last it that long. Other things like goosegrass or crabgrass, I mean they're, they're long, long window of germination as well. So the, bare, the best control is some kind of split application. Uh, a little bit pre, a little bit of atrazine, I don't care what you use, simazine, a little, maybe a half rate of bicep for your soil type. Something, just a, something to buy you a couple weeks in case it gets really wet and you're delayed getting out there. And then go over the top with whatever, Halix, GT, Caprino, what have you. And either atrazine or, or dicamba. Don't go alone. The other thing we're trying to do um, is, is manage our pigweed in corn. And I think all you know here, you know, typically we'll start cutting our corn, what, late August some years? Early September certainly, every year. The time we do that and the time we get a first frost, you can get a lot of pigweed come up. Well, usually it starts, starts really rolling as the corn dries down uh, and you've ruined your crop rotation as far as managing pigweed. Uh, you can get a lot of seed produced uh, from pigweed that come up this late. Um, 
And just these little ones, this one, you know, is coming up, they'll come up in October uh, on you. And I've seen them come up this tall. Now they, they realize the day length's short, they'll start flowering that tall, and they may put on 60, 80 seeds, but still it's 60, 80 seeds. So um, even that late, you can, you, can, you can get seed production out. I mean, it's all a seed bank game. This is really typical. I, I just took this just up, up the river a bit. Run through here, late August, early September, all that light hits the ground. Those pigweeds that were small really jump, and they can produce a lot of seed. Uh, and then next year it looks like that. Uh, you've got to fight all those weeds next year. So it's a seed bank game. We're not doing really good with the herbicides we've got, so anything we can do to keep them beat down, and I don't care what we do, uh, till it up, spray it, what have you. A lot of growers are spraying it now after harvest. And this is one of the studies uh, she did. Uh, she's actually now at Mississippi State. Um, Anyway, this is Gramoxone, right after the line rolled through the field. This is at Jackson. We did this last year. Uh, there's Gramoxone and Zitua, putting a little bit of residual in there to see if that, that would help as well. We were trying to put some in there to help the pigweed from coming up, but what? what? We do a lot of wheat right behind our corn, so <laughs> we got to watch that too. There's only so many things you can do with wheat and really, really sharpen it. Ballard are the only two. Looking at Palmer Amaranth control, because that's the other thing. Some of these pigweeds, you know, after you run the combine through the field, you chew them all up. How, how good a control are you going to get with a contact herbicide? And you could do pretty decent with Paraquat by itself. That's 40 ounces of Gramoxone. We're getting 90%. You put something else in with it, though, like a Sharpen, um, a Zidua, Metribuzin. Uh, we're doing better uh, with those. Plus, we're getting some residual in case we have a real warm year like we did this year, in the 70s in December. Um, you're going to have pigweed do really well in December. This is one of the take home things though from her study uh, where she went and sprayed gramoxone right after the combine root uh, ran through the field. She decreased the soil seed bank 17 million seeds per acre. That's a huge, huge accomplishment. If we could do that on every field, we wouldn't have to worry about it so much in soybeans and cotton. Um, so management you know, of pigweed in corn as far as a rotation, uh, think about after harvest control. And you don't have to spray it. I mean run tillage through it. Um, mow it will help. You'll still see it come back, but at least you'll beat it down again um, and, and maybe set it back some. So tillage, gramoxone, um, I have a number of folks will add a little sharpen, a little valor in there with it just to keep any, any, any more from coming up. And the reason I mentioned that, and I'm going to touch on this this room, is just the PPO resistant pigweed. We got a lot of calls on it this year. We took a huge step back in Tennessee on Palmer pigweed management in, in all our crops, but in particular soybeans because Flexstar no longer worked. Uh, I got calls after calls on fields that looked like this. It reminded me about when we lost Roundup, you know, a decade ago. Uh, this was actually not 25 minutes from here. Uh, it's on the Shelby Tipton County line. We did a lot of work in this field, but it was, you know, it had Valor put down two ounces uh, in them soybeans. Uh, pigweed blew through that in 10 days. They came back and hit it with Flexstar rolled through it, uh, really got a mess. Uh, this is where the PPO resistance is, is today. Um, it's in a dozen counties in Arkansas. We've got it in five counties confirmed in, in Tennessee. There's even one now up in Bowden County, Kentucky, and that's, that's at the confluence of the Ohio and the Mississippi River. Uh, and Jason Bond in Mississippi State just told me they've confirmed it in Mississippi in these counties. Not a surprise. What this tells me is this PPO resistance uh, is didn't just happen this year, even though that's when we found it. It's about a three-year deal. It's got to be at least three years to get to this, be across four states like that. And I'm just sure it's in the boot hill. I don't know how it couldn't be. <laughs> that imaginary line is not going to stop it. It's, it's there. <laughs> it's there. Okay. I hate it, but I'm, just, I'm sure it is. So here we are, folks. Uh, we lost Trefland back in the 80s on Palmer Pigweed. Still finding it today. ALS inhibitors in the 90s. Round up about a decade ago, uh, we're start, starting to lose atrazine in some places. Uh, Georgia was, was not that long ago, and, and then here's the PPOs. We got one more herbicide left. Down here, it's Liberty. How long is it going to last? The shelf life's already limited on it. Um, so anything we can do in corn, <laughs> keep the seed bank beat down, we've got to do it. We are doing some, some things with cover crops, um, trying to, to help manage pigweed in all our crops, but in corn for sure. I've really kind of settled on blends. This is cereal rye and vetch mixed together. We get a really good cover with this. 
uh, and that vetch um, kind of helps the rye get bigger because it gives it some nitrogen and I think it also maybe offsets the carbon penalty a little bit in, in things like corn and cotton the next year. Uh, we were really environmentally friendly with it. We had blackbirds nesting in it until we ran the planter through it. We weren't real happy with that, uh, or the rule of crimper for that matter. Uh, some of the species we looked at, we looked at vetch by itself, we looked at cereal rye, we looked at blends, we looked at wheat, we looked at lupin, and we looked at a lot of different things, but I've really more settled on, on the cereal grasses. And it can be a challenge. Um, uh, this was when we, we, were, we just kind of ran it into stand and vetch, and a lot of that, that corn as it came through, it got caught up in there and really we lost some stand to it. So it does take a little bit of getting it, getting it right as far as figuring out how to, how to set your planter uh, to get it. Uh, this was in severe rye, so we've done it, you know, rolling it and then planting it, um, or just planting into it, standing up. And in cereal rye, that's really big. You get very eliated, and I think we had a little bit of a carbon penalty here, <laughs> in here, or a lelopathy something, because it really stunned it out of the gate. Um, we tried roller crimpers. Um, this is either with a blend of cereal rye and grass, or just cereal rye, and planting into it. So, and what we found is cover crops in most cases provided limited weed control on corn um, just because we, to get the best corn yield, we got to plant it in March or early April, right? Um, our covers just don't have enough growth on them by then to get a lot of weed control. Now, if, you, if you're delayed planting corn into May, you can get some decent value out of it. So, it's, it's limited value in corn compared to, say, in soybeans or cotton when we're, we're more planting in May. Uh, grain sorghum. Uh, Tennessee last year we had everybody was jumping on grain sorghum. Uh, we went from 20,000 acres of grain sorghum to 120,000 acres of grain sorghum in 2015 and 2016 we'll be back to 20,000 acres of grain sorghum <laughs> uh, for a number of reasons. No wonder the commodity price is poor. The other is we, we had some learning curves on it and the big one is if you don't care, take care of your annual grasses in it, I ain't got no options really. Uh, you get calls to fields like this, you know, it's fourth and long, and they want you to draw up a play to save this. There is nothing you can do. Spray it with Roundup and replant. It's about all I know. Um, very limited options. Uh, you know, atrazine or oil, if it's really small, it can do decent. Um, facet, we have a lot of folks go with facet and atrazine, and if the ground's wet, it'll do fairly well, up to about three to four leaf grass. After that, it gets pretty sketchy. Um, but I, I had a hard time thinking about recommending that. It's a $30 treatment. And why are you growing grain sorghum? Because it's a cheap input crop. Well, there goes your cheap input. You just do $30 uh, in it. Uh, disc up and replant or <laughs> round up and replant. We had a fair amount of folks did that. Uh, DuPont is, and Pioneer, I think, will be selling some grain sorghum this year. Y'all are going to have some varieties, do you know? We won't in southern adaptive maturity. Okay. Three or four years. I'm pretty excited about it. We looked at it this past year, and it looked really good. Um, it, it, essentially, it's grain sorghum you put accent on. Of course, we can't call it accent. <laughs> We've got to call it zest. Yeah. But anyway, it's nickel sulfur on its accent. And it really looks good. Uh, I'm pretty excited. It'd be the first time we actually got something that can kill big grass and grain sorghum. And I think it'd have a lot of utility for us. Uh, that one is on the horizon. And so, Greg knew more about it where it's coming than I did. Questions, comments? Um, it's good, good visiting with y'all for either one of us. Any questions or? So that atrazine test in the soil, you can send it to your local university and they can um, Tom Mueller at Knoxville is really the only one that's been running that. Um, there may be some others that, that could run it uh, as far as, as far as atrazine lasting in the soil, but I, it's, he's done it over such a large geography now. We've, he's pulled soil samples out of all over and it's all come out the same. If you're using atrazine in, in the fields, you know, you know, over, you know, say it, even if you're in rotating it, using it every other year over about a five, six year period, you're not going to get any residual activity out of atrazine to speak of. So, fortunately, it doesn't cross over to Princep or to Syncor or things like that, but for atrazine, that's, that's the lay of the land. Yeah, we did. Um, that's a good good question. Um, as far as wh what do you do first? Burn down before it, roll it, burn down. <laughs> and, and, and to tell you the truth, if, if the cover's pretty mature, you know, you're getting into May, you can about roller, roller crimp it and kill it. Uh, you don't even need a herbicide. If it's the corn planting window, March to April, you need to spray it. 
um, to, to, to kill it. The roll of crimper will not do it. Um, <coughs> but that, that's kind of how that, that played out. Um, so the roll of crimper is pretty interesting if, if you have the right year. The guys I've got there planting the weeds through a rod till it radishes, and then they're coming in, they're hitting it with their with roundup in a probably burn down, and then going in, planting into it, and then coming in with residual. Yeah. Oh, that'd be sweet. That ought to work really well. It sure should. So we're getting some decent, like on mayor's tail, we don't even have to worry about it. If you've got a decent cover, it's not a problem. Palmer pigweed, you know, it, it, depending on how good, how thick your cover is and stuff, we're still, you can get 20 days residual maybe out of it, 30, which buys you a lot of time. And overall knocks the numbers down. you got to fight with the herbicides. So uh, I think it's a win. Um, the biggest struggle with it a lot of times is just getting it so as timely as you need to in the fall. Everybody's so darn busy, it's hard to do it. Okay, y'all. Appreciate it. Thank you.